Good evening everyone and welcome to Wednesday Night Live. Uh, I'm excited tonight because it's our first uh, evening of doing our show on a Wednesday night, hence the name change to Wednesday Night Live. I think we've probably done it a couple of times in the past where um, we have filmed on a Wednesday, uh, but it has always been our Monday Night Live and of course now we've changed it to midweek. So I'm really hoping that we will get settled into the new routine and we'll all start to settle into the new time slot of 7pm now that it's winter or coming into winter and dark outside here in Australia. We've moved it a little bit earlier and uh, also we've moved it to Wednesday night so hopefully we'll all get into the routine of that. So hi Karen, thanks for joining. Um, as you all start to join I do want to uh, just mention and acknowledge that it is Anzac Day here in Australia so I hope that everybody uh, was able to spend the day uh, and reflect at some point over the day and uh, I would certainly like to acknowledge our service men, women and animals that have had to make many sacrifices, sometimes the ultimate uh, sacrifice and continue to do so so we can enjoy the liberties and freedoms and the wonderful country that we have uh, to live in on this day. So I want to acknowledge that and uh, I hope everyone did get to have the opportunity to uh, pay their respects in some way today if you are here in Australia for Anzac Day. So tonight for our first uh, Wednesday Night Live edition um, we are talking about a few different topics. I've had a few questions sent through to me. We may have a little bit of time for extra questions, so feel free to, you'll have to comment on them now because I can't actually return to messages now that I'm um, already live. Uh, the first question that we are um, going to talk about this evening, someone sent me a message asking hi Kylie thanks for joining someone sent me a message asking about teaching their horse to lower uh, its head and they were talking about for the simple reason of grooming the forelock and um, putting a hood on the horse now uh, I happen to know this horse and she is a very um, excitable horse and she is quite defensive at times and she wa she was terribly nervous and lacking confidence this mare and I know that the owner has spent a lot of time with the mare and building confidence with her and now she's able to do a lot of stuff with the horse that she wasn't able to do you know you could barely catch the horse before she was very very timid and running away and all that sort of stuff so uh it's the same mare that we're talking about and as i said I, i've i've spoken and seen things um from the owner i know she spent a lot of time with this mare and i know that things are getting better time and time again uh Kathy is saying that she's got no sound. So can anyone let me know if you're not having sound as well? I don't see an issue on my end. Um, my volume's all the way up. I just checked it. And uh, I'm sure there's people saying hello to me, so I'm assuming that they can hear me because no one else has made that comment. So can you please let me know if you're having sound issues? Um, so this mare, the owner, is trying to get the mare to lower her head so she can groom her forelock and so she can get a hood on and she is saying um, that she has tried the pressure and release stuff and it doesn't seem to be being effective or working with the horse. So what I'm going to say is that what we tend to do even when we're training using a um, pressure and release, so Chrissy's saying the sound's fine, Sandy's saying the sound's fine, so Kathy, I hate to say it's probably on your end and you can't hear me say that, so hopefully she'll get it sorted out. Um, so with this mare that is um, having trouble lowering her head, what I would like to say is that the owner is on the right track by using the pressure and release technique as in applying a cue. So I don't know whether she's putting her hand on the top of the head and guiding the head down and taking her hand away as the horse drops its head. Even minutely, you will have to reward bit by bit by bit by bit. Or I don't know if she's using the lead maybe to guide the horse's head down. Either way, it doesn't really matter what technique she's using, providing that she continues to use the same technique um, consistently. And what I am going to say, though, is make sure you aren't getting caught up in what it actually is that you're trying to do, which is 
groom the forelock and put the hood on because what happens when you do that when you get that energy about you 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 know you start to encourage the horse to put its head down the horse goes i don't really want to put my head down and finally you know you get pressure and the horse lowers its head and you release and say good horse and then you say and now i'm gonna do this and the horse goes i knew i shouldn't have put my head down um, I knew that you wanted to do something else. So it's going to take um, time and time. Hey, Hillary. Hey, Joanne. Thanks for joining. Um, it's going to take multiple, multiple repetitions with this horse of just putting her head down for the sake of putting her head down without then trying to add something else that you're actually trying to achieve, like putting her hood on and, um, and grooming her forelock. Uh, so that's number one is don't get caught up in what you're actually trying to do. Um, try and stay focused on the bit that comes before the bit you want to do, which is actually just teaching the horse to be guided down and lowering her head. So that's number one. Number two is going to be overall building the horse's confidence in general. So when you're talking about a horse lowering its head, you are lowering its head and they do feel quite exposed and quite... Um, um, I can't think of the word that I'm looking for, but the horses do get quite nervous putting their head down. Uh, it is a very insecure place for the horse to be. It's not necessarily other than when they're, they're eating, um, they wouldn't really lower their head uh, to, to a real low point because they like to have their head at a point where they can see what's going on. And if you're at a busy place and things like that and there's noises and things like that happening, the horse is going to want to have their head at a spot where they can look around. So improving the horse's confidence in general overall is going to build the horse's confidence to be able to stay down there. Um, when you are teaching her to lower her head. So number one, don't get focused on what it is that you're trying to achieve. Just simply teach the horse to lower its head. Number two, um, build the horse's confidence around other areas. So this can be any, you know, this can be handling, leading, um, picking up their feet, taking them for a walk around the paddock, doing obstacles with them, doing the ground skills with them, doing building a citizenship work with them, doing anything with them. It's not getting them confident about lowering their head specifically. It's about generally improving their confidence overall. And once they've started to improve their confidence overall, you're going to see an improvement in the willingness to stay down there with their head. The third thing to do with, um, hey babe, thanks for watching. Uh, the third thing to do with a horse um, when you're talking about what it wanting to lower its head or teaching it how to lower its head is um, making it something that is actually uh, comfortable for the horse and, and if you can, make it something that the horse looks forward to. So the lady that sent me the question about the horse not wanting to put its head down mentioned that she thought the horse might not want to put its head down because its ears are actually itchy. So if you can teach the horse that when she puts her head down that you are actually going to scratch those ears for her and she builds confidence around that, she's going to be following you around with her head down on the ground because she's going to want to put her head down so you can scratch her ears. So if you can turn that around, um, hey Liz, hey Nivenka, how are you? Um, if it, it Navinka, 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 ha, it's an internal joke. Um, if you can encourage the horse to lower its head and the horse wants to lower its head because it's going to get something um, that it wants, so get an itch or something like that happen to it, it's going to actually start to present that action to you without you having to fight it all the time. So they're the top three things that I would use in regards to uh, teaching a horse how to lower its head. So you were on the right track in using pressure and release. I wouldn't abandon that technique. Um, I would just slow it down and present it at a glacial pace and do those couple of other um, items as well. Uh, so the second question that we had sent through to us today, um, and I know that the lady is watching, uh, she has got a horse in a paddock. He's, he's been um, put in an, in an adjustment paddock, and it is a mixed paddock. So there's mares and there's geldings. 
um, in the paddock and there's kerfuffle happening at the moment. So he's kind of getting beaten up. He's getting a few um, bite marks taken out of him. And the last few times that she's gone down to the paddock, she's pulled him out and he's had quite significant, like, you know, they're drawing blood. Uh, he's had significant bite marks out of him and she's asking what she should do about it, if there's anything that she can do about it. Um, hi, Frankie. And uh, if there is, you know, should she take the horse out of the paddock? So um, my kind of general rules are leave the horse in the paddock. They will eventually sort it out um, amongst each other. But there are a couple of um, conditions that I would put on that. I happen to know the area in which um, the horse is being adjusted. And I know that sometimes the paddocks are quite small. So one of the conditions on leaving the horse in that situation would be to make sure that the paddock is big enough that he can actually get away from um, the, the other horses when they're beating him up. So what sometimes happens is if you put the horses in a paddock that's too small and you've got one that's trying to chase the other one away to assert dominance and that one can't get far enough away, the dominant horse doesn't realize that the submissive horse can't go any further because there's a fence in the way. The dominant horse is just saying, "Red flag! You're not getting, um, you, you're not getting out of my way. I'm gonna keep chasing you and keep chasing you and keep chasing you." So if it's that situation, if they're kind of relentlessly chasing him down and he is unable to get away and he's unable to create um, enough distance, um, then I would absolutely. Uh, have to move him out of that paddock but if they're kind of chasing him away and he goes over there and eats grass and then they leave him alone i wouldn't worry about it if they're able to create space hey skylar i do and i am thank you um so the second thing is that there needs to be a good balance hey simon uh there needs to be a good balance in the paddock of horses that are being worked and stimulated or uh, or are too old to need the stimulation. So what I mean by that is, is you, if you've got a horse in a paddock that's being constantly chased around, constantly chased around and tormented by another horse, you've got to look at that other horse and say, is that horse being fair, as in is he just being a normal horse and trying to assert dominance, or is that horse overfed, underworked, under stimulated and so are they chasing your horse around because they're just having a good time are they just making a game out of it are they making fun out of it is it kind of like you know there's a four-year-old horse in the paddock who needs to be stimulated and he's all like i want you to play with me so i'm just going to chase you around the paddock and this is a game kind of like you know, if you've got a Kelpie dog, if our, if our dog gets out of the yard, he goes across the road and starts rounding up the horses because that's what he was bred for and he's a young dog. So um, if we don't keep our, uh, we, we've got him in a, in a yard, obviously, and he doesn't get out of our yard. Um, but if someone leaves the gate open or something like that on the odd occasion, he'll take himself off and look for stimulation he'll look for something to keep his mind busy so if you've got that situation happening in a paddock then the other horses either need to get worked more which is going to be hard for you to kind of demand that the owners ride them enough or they're going to have to reduce energy intake and things like that which i'm pretty sure you're going to be unsuccessful with in that pursuit anyway um unless they're an owner that is genuinely open to you know suggestions and things like that um you know, she mentioned that there was a mixed paddock and I do prefer a mare paddock and a gelding paddock because it does avoid these kind of issues. Um, she has said that the paddock is blended because the owner only has two paddocks. So they put all the horses in one side while the other one's resting and then they move them and, and put them all in that side while the other one's resting. And I totally understand that. And I have seen mixed paddocks be very successful um, and, and have no trouble or anything like that if you're following these um, conditions. So uh, it is my preference, but if that's not an option, which it isn't an option, I thought I'd raise that for the other people watching who might be having um, this problem, then um, uh, you can have a mixed paddock that can get along together and uh, they learn to live with each other. You know, horses aren't silly. They learn on pressure and release. So if you've got a situation where the horse that is chasing him or biting him, is if they're doing that because he's in the wrong place and when he gets out of their way or if he leaves them alone, if they then leave him alone to go and eat grass, 
then let it let it happen. It, it, you know, I don't think it's a major deal. Um, as I said, I'd have to watch him actually being chased to see how aggressive or relentless or anything it is. Um, you know, we've got a rule here at our house where we always say a happy horse has scars. And what we mean by that is, you know, when we put our boys and girls together, they do play, they do fight, they do chase each other, they do do all of that stuff. Horses are going to be horses. They're going to have scars. If you're worried about the show ring or something, just invest in some good makeup and go ahead and cover those scars up because your horse is going to be a lot more mentally um, and psychologically balanced and physically healthy if he is allowed to run in a herd situation, which is their natural environment. He's going to sleep better. He's going to have social skills developing and all that sort of stuff. Having them in a herd situation, the benefits of having them in a herd far outweigh the negatives um, of, you know, a few bite marks here and there. And I know that we see it and we go, oh my God, they're drawing blood. But, you know, that's a game. Honestly, our horses bite each other and draw blood all the time. And it is just play. And I have seen the opposite. We've got a couple of horses that cannot go into in the paddock with each other because they will relentlessly just keep attacking each other, um, you know, and it is a fight to the death, you have to separate them. But unless it's that kind of situation, as long as, as long as there's a pause in it, as long as he can get away and they go and eat over there and he goes and eats over there, then I wouldn't worry too much about it. And, uh, you know, I'm sure you'll see it settle down over the next month or so. Um, and if it doesn't, then maybe you can come back to me and let me know that it hasn't settled down and we can talk about it a little bit more in depth in regards to the exact situation. So I hope that that helped in regards to your question. Um, let me get to another one. It looks like we are going to have time for a few more questions. So anyone watching, if you've got a specific question that you'd like me to answer while I'm on, um, please go ahead and put it in the comments. Do not send it to me as a private message or comment on the post itself. You have to comment on this live feed now because now that I'm on, I can't actually access the other stuff. Um, so another comment that I got was, which is the best saddle for my horse? And, um, you know, we had a bit of a conversation about this briefly at the course over the weekend. And I know that saddle choice and saddle fit is something that is um, a, a massive bone of contention for a lot of people. Um, and look, you know, I've, I've been involved in horses for many, many years. And, um, and all I can say is it, you know, saddle up because the ride continues in regards to the saddle problems and all that sort of stuff you you know my horses change shape i've got different horses so i own three different saddles at the moment um i've got a dressage saddle i've got a fender saddle and i've got my western saddle and i change those saddles depending on the work that i'm going to be going out and doing with my horses i change the saddles depending on um, which one fits the horse the best at the time. So I've just brought my little horse Squizzy back into training and I've got her in the dressage saddle at the moment. So, um, you know, it's an uncomfortable saddle for me. It doesn't fit me really well. Um, it, it's, um, you know, it's making me sore in the hips, but it fits her pretty well. It's a nice light saddle for her first time out uh, or for her first couple of weeks in training. Um, it fits her back. She's super round at the moment, so it fits her really well. So you need to choose the saddle that's appropriate for the work that you're going to be doing. Um, any discipline specific requirements. I know a lot of us have dif discipline specific requirements um, in regards to, you know, it, it, traditional dressage. You need to have a dressage saddle. And uh, there are certain disciplines where you can um, change your gear around. So it just depends. Obviously, camp drafters need to ride in a fender saddle, etc., etc. So uh, you really need to make the choice um, primarily, like the first thing that you should be taking into consideration is the horse and what saddle is going to fit fit the horse properly um, because otherwise there's no point in doing a discipline if your horse is going to be sore because then uh, you know you're going to make them sore and they're not going to be sound for competition anyway uh, but then the second thing you need to ask yourself is what fits you and then the third thing is is what what are the requirements of my discipline um, and I do know that there's some people who will um, I do know that there's some people who do um, have like a working saddle during the week and when they go and compete they'll change the saddles i'm not a big fan of that i'm i i wouldn't change a saddle to go into a competition um because i think that you run the risk of the horse feeling different and uncomfortable and it runs it runs into um you run into your own sort of problems there 
but uh, you, you know that that may be an option in regards to discipline specific gear if you don't want to train in a dressage saddle then ride in your normal everyday fender or western saddle during the week and then when, whenever you go to a dressage competition go and pop it on for, for that one class um, but obviously you know warm up well in it so the horse isn't sort of got a new saddle on and 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 going to express his opinion about your new saddle uh, you know within the show ring um, the next question is when is the right time to give my horse a break after intensive work and uh, the reason this question came up is because over the weekend um, I actually had two conversations with two separate people um, uh, just in regards to they had been doing fairly intensive as in daily work with their horses they had been doing a daily routine with their horses I'm not going to say it was high intensity as in workload but intensity as in every single day they were going out and doing some kind of training or some kind of riding or some kind of something with their horse and both of them caught it sort of said oh you know when's the right time to give my horse a break and what i said was um you probably need to consider giving your horse a break in a way um that you're still actually going and visiting your horse because you know, we spend all this time and we invest all this time and money and um, effort into building a relationship with our horse and, you know, getting him to the point where he looks forward to seeing us and we want, you know, he sees us coming into the paddock and goes, oh, great, you know, you're here today and I want to know what you're doing and he comes up to us and then all of a sudden we can't ride the horse and, and or we want to give him a break and then he barely sees us for two or three weeks or however long the break is. So, um, you know, that's going to be... Uh, have psychological effects on your horse because he it, he's seen you every single day he's had interaction with you every single day and then all of a sudden you're gone or all of a sudden you're turning up throwing a bucket of feet at him and walking out the um walking back out of the paddock so you're no longer spending quality time with the horse so i think when you're wanting to give your horse a break from riding that that's fantastic the horses all need a break every now and then from riding but i think that um you need to not give him a break from you because you've just spent all that time building a horse that's used to having you turning up and that sort of stuff. So give him a break from the work maybe or change the work or change um, what you're doing when you're spending time with him but don't actually disappear altogether or simply, you know, just throw feet at him and walk away and, uh, and change the dynamics of the um, interactions that you've been having with the horse. Uh, so I can see a couple of questions are starting to roll in. So Frankie says, bit or no bit? And my answer to that is, uh, your horse will tell you. So uh, the reason I say that, again, I've got four different horses here. I've got, um, and I've probably ridden Cooper in every single type of, or not every single bit available on the market, obviously. But he's been in a snaffle. He's been in a... Um, loose ring snaffle, he's been in a D-ring snaffle, he's been in a single joint snaffle, he's been in a miler snaffle, he's been in a uh, double jointed snaffle, he's been in a uh, little shank bit, he's been in the two rein, he's been in the hackamore, I can ride him bridleless, etc, etc, etc. So I've really, I've got no aversion to bit or no bit, I'm not, a, I'm not in any school when it comes to that. Um, I'm in a school of riding uh, without a bit. When I'm first starting the horse under saddle, I ride them um, in a, in, typically in a Bosal or a Hackamore. Um, and the first couple of rides, I ride them in a halter and one rein. And then, it, depending on the owner's requirements, I will snaffle, put a snaffle in the horse's mouth if that is a requirement of the owner. And I do try and all, um, I also try and, um, avoid the horse's mouth with a bit probably up until they're about five years old because there's so much happening in regards to teeth capping and teeth coming through and all that kind of stuff happening so i really try and stay out of the mouth that's my personal philosophy um but once they're sort of i mean you know i've got three horses that haven't been bridled um that have never had a bit in their mouth in their lives before. Uh, one of them is eight, one of them is 12, and one of them is five. So I'm not saying that when the horse is five, I don't follow the Western school of thought of, oh, he's six years old, you've got to put him in a bridle. I'm not about that at all. I happily ride a horse in the Hackamore till the day it dies. That doesn't, that's not what I'm saying. Um, I think that each horse individually will show you their preferences. Um, Hillary's there saying, you know, she's got some that, you know, she's got nine or 11 or something like that. Um, and 
she's got some that prefer a bit and some that don't prefer a bit. And and they will tell you if you've got the ability to try different things and see how they go. And again, sometimes it's discipline specific. You are required to use a, a bit in some disciplines. Um, but if you're not, if there's no discipline requirement, then you know, let the horse tell you what he's comfortable with and, and what the best method of communication is. I will say that if you're looking to use a bit for control, um, that you're barking um, down the wrong path, that you that, that you need to have a, 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 an effective method of communication with your horse so he doesn't, um, you don't feel like you need to put a bit on to control him. But if you're looking to put a bit into your horse's mouth because... Um, you know, it's going to enhance the communication or it's going to change the communication or it's going to help him carry himself a little differently, um, et cetera, et cetera, then absolutely um, just let the horse tell you wh what they are or are not comfortable with. And I think that that's, a, that, that's certainly my approach to it. I'm not anti-bit and I'm not, um, not anti-no-bit either. Uh, the next question that I saw there from Kathy was a question about slowing your horse down uh, when it comes to eating hard feed. She said he's not choking or anything at the moment, but she would like to be able to slow him down because uh, it sounds like he's a bit of a gut. Um, so, yes, you can actually buy special feeders. Um, they're kind of like the dog bucket. So you can buy dog bowls that slow your dogs down from eating and and instead of the bottom of the bowl just being a smooth base like that, they actually have like things sticking up in them. So the dogs have to eat around like, um, you know, little little things sticking up all over the place. I, I believe that there are um, feeders like that that you can buy for horses that will slow them down in regards to um, eating their hard feed. The other thing is with regards to slowing him down, um, I know you're talking about half feed. Obviously, there's slow feeder hay nets and things like that that's going to slow him down in regards to hay. Um, but when you're talking about hard feed, yes, I believe there's those buckets. Um, and there's also um, maybe if he thinks he's, if he's gorging it because he feels threatened that someone's going to take it from him, you might have to remove him from, um, uh, you know, other horses that he may be perceiving as a threat. Maybe that's why he's gorging it down. Uh, and depending on how much time you've got, if you've got, the, if you're actually sitting there with him, then I would probably feed it to him slower as well is another option. That's probably the um, the, the slowest option, um, but it's probably most effective without going out and buying, you know, the buckets and things like that. So I hope that helped. Uh, let me see if I can find, I think I saw a couple of other questions come up. Uh, let's see. No, I don't think I can get them up. If anyone's got another question that they want to uh, post, I'm happy to see if I can read it here. Uh, Frankie's saying, I ride mainly in the Hackamore and Bose or very rarely in a bit and my girls are only three and a half. Yeah, absolutely. That's that's totally fine. If you don't if you don't have any requirement of putting them in a bridle, then I you know, I, I and they're happily going along in the Hackamore, then definitely just leave you know, leave them in that uh, leave them in the Hackamore. That's fine. Like I say, my my horse is twelve. <laughs> She's never been, uh, never been in a bridal. Uh, oh, here we go. Let me see if I can see these other comments, these other questions. My horse doesn't really like her saddle being put up or any other saddle. Is there a way I can reintroduce it to her so she's okay with it? The fit is fine. So what she's probably doing um, in regards to the saddle, most of the time it's a learned behavior from a horse. Uh, they have experienced pain in the past and... Um, they have experienced pain in the past and they've got a pain association with the saddle. And so uh, the easiest thing to do in regards to that, and I think, Liz, you were at my cult starting demonstration at the Vigero Gathering in New Zealand. 
um, the easiest thing to do with that is to slowly reintroduce the saddle the way that I did um, with that colt. So just putting it on and taking it off again and, you know, letting her smell it and letting her see it and just kind of slowing down you putting that saddle on again to a glacial pace. You know, let her touch it with her nose, let her rub her nose on it, let her really be a part of the process. Um, and then once you've put it on, you don't have to cinch it up straight away. Let it kind of sit there and let her relax into it sitting there and then take it off her back again and then go ahead and put it on. So you have to break that pattern that has been established by that horse of, you know, she's, I don't know what she's doing, but she's, um, you know, it sounds like she's pulling faces or something like that um, in regards to the, um, in regard, you know, when you, when you put the saddle on. So go ahead and put it on, wait for her to have a happy face and then go ahead and take it off and, you know, just talk her through it and rubber and things like that. And hopefully that'll help reintroduce the saddle to her. Uh, Hillary saying, I have a horse that I'm having trouble slowing down in the trot and the canter. Uh, I, my go-to with regards to that, Hillary, is always a balance issue with the horses. Typically, um, you and I know you've heard me say this, you know, a gazillion times before, it's this little kid running down the hill um, analogy that I like to use. You know, when the kid first starts running down the hill, he's got control, he's got control, and then there's a point on that hill that the kid loses control and momentum takes over, and all the kid is doing then is putting his feet under his face so he doesn't trip over. So what typically happens to horses um, is the same thing. They start losing balance, and as they lose balance, they, they get faster and faster and faster and faster, and it's often, um, you know, it can be a physical balance issue, it can be an anxiety general issue as um, you know I'm not sure which horse you're talking about so I don't know how long they've had under saddle or anything like that um, sometimes they can get a little anxious under saddle sometimes they can get a little worried in in those faster um, you know gates under saddle so the initial thing that I would start doing is um, asking for an upward transition into the trot doing four or five slide strides and then bringing it back to a walk and then going back up into the trot, four or five strides, bring it back down to a walk. I know that you do a lot of trails and things like that. So if it's one of the horses that you can take on the trail, I would be doing that on the trail because what, what you will create is a horse that's beginning to anticipate the stop or the walk or downward transition. And so as they start to anticipate the downward transition, they start to hold themselves up a little bit more and they start to hold themselves in balance a little bit more. And then they can, you know, in preparation for the transition. And then uh, that in turn will allow you to take that trot from five strides to six strides to seven strides and then down and up and down. And um, soon enough, you'll have a horse holding himself in the trot because he's sort of, almost starting to anticipate the downward transition and then you can repeat the um you can repeat the exercise under at the at the canter and um and that's going to help him slow down his canter as well the other thing that you can do in regards to that or the other benefit of doing that exercise where you're only doing a few strides and then um coming back down again is that the horse will um, start to get confidence in that the trot and the canter is only a few strides. And so um, as long as your downward transition is quite smooth, they won't get worried about the downward transition and they'll start holding themselves together a little better and sort of breathing through the trot because, they, you know, he could be holding his breath or she could be holding her breath. Uh, they could be holding their breath and sort of going, okay, we're trotting, we're trotting, we're trotting. What you want them to do is go, oh, that's okay. We only do five strides oh, that's okay, we only do five strides. And then you're teaching them to relax as well through the through the transitions and things like that. Okay, um, what else? Hey, Brittany. Uh, doesn't like the saddle, we've done all that. Okay. Oh, okay, so Hillary's saying he's highly trained in traditional dressage and also leans on the bit quite a bit. I believe that he has been trained to be this way, but I don't like to put pressure on the reins. So what you've got on your hands is a horse that has been um, taught to drive into your hands. And, uh, and so if you're not taking up contact, which is what he's used to on the reins, he quite possibly is rushing as part of anxiety because he's worried that he can't actually 
feel you. So the same exercise is going to help him as well because he's going to feel you come in. So what you what what we're what I'm basically saying is you've got what you've got on your hands is a horse that's not comfortable with a freestyle rein because he's looking for you. He's going, "Where are you? I'm so used to my rider being you know, there with those tense reins or with that contact on my mouth and you're kind of throwing him away because you don't want to touch his mouth, but it, that makes him worried because that's, well, that's all he knows, right? So you've kind of got to um, pick up that feel and uh, you could even do the exercise where you pick up the reins, let him feel you and then just give him back a little bit and then pick him up and let him feel you and put him back a bit. And so the downward transition exercise is going to work. And also uh, the exercise where you just pick up contact and then freestyle for a couple of strides, contact, and then freestyle for a couple of strides. And that's going to, you're sort of saying, here I am, you're okay. There you go. Here I am, you're okay. There you go. Here I am, you're okay, here you go. So he's starting to go, oh, okay, she's still there, it's just a different feeling. So our, our horse was like that when we got when we first got her. One of our horses was like that. And she used to panic when you let the reins go because she had no idea how you know how to function that way. Kathy's saying, how long can you do flat work with? Uh, do they switch off after a certain amount of time? Uh Yes, I'm going to say the short answer to that is yes, um, especially if you're doing um, flat work training for your benefit, uh, for something that you're interested in and there's no kind of interaction with the horse and there's no benefit in it in the horse and it's hard to explain to the horse what the benefit is, if that makes sense. So it's kind of like taking me to the gym putting me on the treadmill for 30 minutes and saying, there you go, Tanya. You know, this is why gyms have new treadmills where you can plug in your iPhone and you can uh, watch your TV shows and you can, you know, pretend you're running through the forest and all that stuff because it sucks to run on a treadmill and do the same thing over and over and over again. So, um, you know, absolutely horses will switch off. Not only will they mentally switch off, but once the horse gets to a physical point of fatigue, he's not learning anything anyway. All he's doing is waiting for the session to stop, session to stop, session to stop. Um, Kathy's saying she's doing two hours of flat work. It's, yeah, two, look, two hours of flat work in my book is too much, absolutely. Um, if you want to ride for two hours, go on a trail ride. Take the horse to the beach. Take the horse, uh, uh, you know, over a cross-country course. So at least he, there's things that, I'm not saying don't ride the horse for two hours, but I'm, I'm saying two hours of flat work around and around and around in circles is, is, is um, it's not mentally stimulating, it's not physically stimulating, it's physically fatiguing, um, and it's mentally fatiguing for the horse. So I, I, I don't think there's a benefit in that at all. Absolutely not. Uh, Chrissy's saying... Two brothers that were cut late, seven years old, fine in the paddock together, then a filly was introduced. Oh, oh that's not good. Um, one has taken the mare and fights his brother. I've taken them um, on since this. No handling, no human contact. One brother is nearly finished starting, going great, ready to ride, but now stallion traits still instilled in these geldings, and I don't know if it's safe to paddock either with a mare as they want to dominate them and take them away from other geldings in the paddock and wants to fight them. Uh, should I let them sort it out or is the behavior too instilled and will not leave them? Okay, so I would say, um, Chrissy, number one, when you're talking about stallion behavior and they're cut, they've been cut late, they those two horses need to live with only geldings for an extended period of time. So we have got exactly the same situation with um, our two horses, um, my partner's horse Coop, uh, my my horse Cooper, and my partner's horse George. They were cut late as stallions. We can put them in the paddock together. We can put them in the paddock together with other geldings, and there's kerfuffle, but it's not major fighting. We cannot put them in a paddock with other mares and geldings. I can run Cooper alone with a bunch of mares. We can run George alone with a bunch of mares. So effectively saying, yes, you're a stallion. Here's a bunch of mares for you to run around with. And that works really well. It doesn't work if the horse um, has got other geldings that he needs to fight off. 
once you've got them started under saddle and they're going well and they're being stimulated in that way and once they've been running as and and the bigger the herd of geldings and the bigger the paddock that you can get them in the better because they'll soon um when when there's only one on one there's a lot more stallion behavior happening between the two and they're still sort of behaving like stallions because uh you know they're fighting each other and they still think they're stallions whereas you put, put them in with a couple of old geldings and the old geldings are going to be like you're not stallions boot you know uh, and they're going to get they're going to develop social skills because the problem that you've got with these two horses is that they don't have social skills either because i'm assuming they weren't they they weren't run in a herd because they were stallions so they were run in some kind of obviously with each other or they were left alone so you've got the you you've basically got horses with no social skills who still think that they're stallions just even even though the testosterone is um is taking it out so um, that, that would be my suggestion. So you need to only put them in the paddock with geldings and make sure it's a big enough paddock and preferably geldings that are going to dominate them a little bit because at the moment you've got two boys who's a bit too big for their boots, but I wouldn't remove any mares from the situation. Um, or you need to run each one individually with their own band of mares. Uh, and the mares will teach them social skills, um, but if they served before they were gelded, then you, you, you know, you're running into the potential like George served and um, he will still, um, he'll still serve the mares now, even though he's a gelding, he's been a gelding for four years and we're, and we're four years down the track. So uh, it is a long, slow process. Um, and sometimes for the safety of all the other horses, it is better to simply, um, you know, let them just be in a bachelor herd or in a paddock with their own mares if you've got a paddock that's really big and you're able to um you know put them in with other mares and there's lots of other mares and lots of other geldings then what will happen is that they'll create their own bands and they'll separate off but um if if the paddock's too small or if the other horses try and argue or fight with them too much then you do run the risk of damages occurring while that while all that gets sorted out so i hope that that helped um, Jane saying to add to Hillary's question, my horse is a little too rushy. I find it difficult to slow my rising to the tempo I want to, and I tend to match him. Any good tricks? I've tried this so much. And instructors keep saying slow your rising, but I try and try, but to little success. Um, so the same exercise will help you as well. So only doing four or five strides and then coming back to the walk four or five strides coming back to the walk, four or five strides coming back to the walk. Um, because what I'm what I'm going to guess is happening is as you start rising, the horse is actually building in his speed and you get faster and faster. It's not like from rise number one that you're immediately going faster. So that exercise is going to teach him to come back to you. Um, and, and bringing him back to the walk is going to teach him to come back to you as well because then as soon as he's rushing, you're saying, no, we're going to walk and trot again. No, we're going to walk and trot again. No, we're going to walk and trot again. And so he's going to start to anticipate the walk and hopefully balance himself. Um, he's going to help. Uh, he's going to balance himself and slow down and manage his energy a little bit more. Um, trot poles can slow them down. Uh, if you've got well-placed trot poles, that can tend to slow them down because they're trying to negotiate the trot poles. That can really help. Um, the other one that you can try and do is rise for two, um, rise for two, sit for two, rise for two, sit for two, or you can go into the sitting trot and uh, and manage the speed there in the sitting trot. And I'm also going to say that when um, when you're trying to slow your rising, make sure that you're breathing um, slowly as well, because what we tend to do is match them in breath, and so we start to go, <laughs> and then we're rising really fast instead of going. And really holding the space there. So I hope that helped. Um, and I think we're just about coming to the end of all the questions. So that was a really good session. I really enjoyed it. Thank you so much for, for joining me tonight on our first Wednesday Night Live. I really look forward to seeing all of you guys next Wednesday. Uh, now I am heading to the Northern Territory for three weeks on Monday. Um, whether I am live next Wednesday, I don't know. At this point in time, I think I will be live. Um, but if there seems to be a problem in regards to 
um, Wi-Fi connection or something like that, I will have pre-filmed them and they will, um, they'll pop up live, um, Oh, you know, at the seven o'clock time slot, I will pre-film and put them on my YouTube channel and they'll go live at seven o'clock on next Wednesday. Um, and if I have to pre-film them, I'll pre-film them for my entire trip. And, uh, and then I look forward to seeing all of you guys live when I come back again. But uh, in the meantime, I hope that you have all enjoyed tonight's Wednesday Night Live. I hope that I am here live next Wednesday. Uh, thank you so much for joining me and I hope you have a great rest of the week. Talk to you all later.